no, no it's, uh, it's hard. It's challenging. Um, I live three blocks up the street from that store. Um, you're worried about your neighbors. You're worried about your partner. You're worried about everything when you get that call. And so, yeah, I feel numb. Um, and it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to talk to victims, uh, their families. Um, you know, it's tragic. An emotional police chief trying to put the unimaginable into words as another community mourns. Another mass shooting, the second in a week. What we're learning about the victims ranging from 20 to 65. The heroic officer who heard the barrage of 911 calls and lost his life running into the grocery store. And the new details on the suspect escorted in handcuffs by police. Were there possible warning signs that were missed? surge at the border. The first images from inside one of the processing centers housing migrant kids. Our Cecilia Vega is with authorities on patrol finding children ages 9 and 10 who made the journey alone, both with phone numbers of their loved ones written on their clothes. Biden's challenge, the president trying to tout his COVID relief bill and the benefits instead battling two emergencies. What will he do about the unaccompanied children heading to the U.S.? And will lawmakers listen to his call for new gun control? Stimulus for the homeless. What do you do if you lost everything in the pandemic, including a home, and need that check? Or if you've lived on the streets for years and this is a lifeline? future cures. Our in-depth look at the technology behind the mRNA COVID vaccines. We now have tools in our hands as scientists, as, as clinicians that, um, that sounded like science fiction a few years ago. Could it be used to solve illnesses like cancer? Good evening. I'm Eva Pilgrim in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. It's as American as apple pie, but that doesn't make the second mass shooting in a week any less jarring. The victims, 10 in all, some buying groceries, others trying to get a COVID vaccine, plus an officer, a father of seven who lost his life trying to protect others. These images are so familiar to us all now. People running for their lives, SWAT teams moving in, the flags just raised after honoring the Atlanta victims now lowered again to honor another group gone too soon. And now the calls for gun control and the pushback. President Biden saying he wants the ban on automatic weapons reinstated. But will anything actually change? We have so much to get to tonight, but our Matt Gutman leads us off from Boulder with what we've learned about that deadly supermarket shooting. Tonight, eyewitnesses describe how an ordinary trip to the supermarket turned into an afternoon of terror, one that left 10 dead and the city of Boulder reeling. Dean Schiller came to shop for groceries. Instead, he found this. Uh, someone's down right here. Something just happened here, guys. Look, there's people lying in the f street, guys. He went in the store. right down there. Oh, my God. Guys, we got people down inside King Supers. There's Holy sh there's a shooter, active shooter, get away. Ryan Borowski came for soda and a bag of chips. First shot, I thought it was an accident. I thought somebody dropped something. Second shot, I, that question was gone. Third shot, I knew it was gunfire. Ryan tells me he saw a woman running towards him, a terrified look on her face. Then he started running too. After I was running, I definitely heard more shots. Kind of like pop, 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 pop. King Supers was also a COVID vaccination site, and Steve McHugh's son-in-law, Paul, was there to get one. Paul was in line to go get a COVID shot. Third person in line, and that's when at least one shooter came in and killed the woman at the front of the line in front of him. We got people down on the ground. Paul and his two young daughters sprinting for cover. They ran upstairs to hide, they hid in a coat closet, standing up for 45 minutes. Extraordinarily uh, terrifying. Of course, the, the little one saying, yeah, and you know, the coats weren't long enough to hide our feet as they were standing behind the coats in the closet. Sarah Moonshadow was there with her 21-year-old son. I just started counting in between shots to, and listening to see what direction he was heading in. I looked at my son and I, I told him, 
We only have three seconds. Like, we have to move now. If we don't, we're not going to have another opportunity. Sarah didn't see the gunman, but store employees described him to police as relentless, methodically going through the store and parking lot where he shot an elderly man and then stood over him and shot him multiple additional times. Once we got outside, I noticed that there were people laying in the street and they weren't moving and instantly I started running for them. <sighs> And my son grabbed me and said, no, we can't do anything. They're out in the open. And so we ran. By then, police were on the way. Looks like we have an active shooter. of a white male, middle-aged, dark hair, beard, black vest, short lead shirt. The okay. first responding officer, Tally, that had showed up, I was going to try to flag him down. And my son mm -hmm. uh, was uh, too afraid to let me go. You mean you think you saw him running? No, I know I saw him. He was uh, he was coming down the street and turning into the parking lot. Officer Eric Talley, an 11 year veteran of the force and father of seven, was the first one there. He was shot in the head and he died at the scene. Officer down inside the building. Eric Talley died heroically. He died charging into the line of fire to save people who were simply trying to live their lives and go food shopping. His father said he was looking for a job to keep himself off of the front lines. He didn't want to put his family through something like this. His sister, Kirsten, tweeting this picture, saying, I cannot explain how beautiful he was and what a devastating loss this is to so many. Fly high, my sweet brother. So many lives cut short, the victims ranging in age from 20 to 65. 25-year-old Ricky Olds was a manager at the supermarket. She'd been there six years, her uncle Robert calling her the light of the room. Jody Waters was 65. She had two daughters, a grandchild, and dreams of opening her own boutique. Denny Strong also worked at the grocery store, and Suzanne Fountain, friends say she loved the theater. Our hearts go out to all the victims killed during this senseless act of violence. Police say the shooter is 21-year-old Ahmed Alisa, an American citizen who came here from Syria as a three-year-old. They say he'd been wearing a green tactical vest and carrying an AR-15 style rifle and a semi-automatic handgun. They say there was a gunfight. Alisa was shot in the leg and then he surrendered. Police walking him out of the supermarket into an ambulance. The rampage finally over. Today, President Biden expressing anguish at another mass shooting on the heels of last week's shooting spree in Atlanta, which left eight dead. While the flag was still flying half-staff for the tragedy, another American city has been scarred by gun violence and resulting trauma. And a state that I even hate to say it because we were saying it so often, my heart goes out. The president paying tribute to Officer Talley. Every time an officer walks out of his or her home and pins that badge on, the family member that they just said goodbye to wonders whether they'll subconsciously, will they get that call, the call that his wife got. Tonight, Officer Talley's patrol car draped in flowers, a memorial to his sacrifice. And Matt Gutman joins us now. Matt, we still have no idea about a motive, right? Uh, no, police are working on it along with the FBI. It's obviously an intense search for a motive, but no word yet. It's really early in the investigation. Now, the suspect surrendered to police. He refused to speak with them on the scene. He did, however, Eva, ask to speak with his mother. Now, you know, over the past hours that we've been here, we've been watching uh, investigators coming in and out of that supermarket. The police chief here said it'll take at least five days just to process that scene. And this morning, prosecutors said it'll take a year just to get through the entire investigation. Of course, that suspect faces 10 counts of first-degree murder. Diva. Matt Gutman for us there in Boulder, Colorado. Matt, thank you. And now to the investigation and the emerging picture of the suspect from family and people who knew him. ABC's Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas has the latest. Tonight, police uncovering potentially ominous missed signals as they investigate accused mass murderer Ahmed Alyssa. According to newly released charges, a female family member told police Alyssa was playing with, quote, a machine gun about two days ago at his residence. Family members were angry that Alyssa was openly handling the weapon in the home and took it away from him before it was eventually returned. Another potentially chilling indicator of what was coming. Alyssa last Tuesday bought a Ruger AR-556, 
a pistol that looks remarkably like a small assault rifle, which can accommodate a 30-round clip. Police say Alyssa did not have a lengthy record, but investigators did point out that he was convicted in 2018 for misdemeanor assault on a high school student, accused of repeatedly punching that student. Other classmates telling the Denver Post that while Alyssa was often pleasant, he was quick to anger and once threatened to kill his peers. But why Alyssa, only 21 years old, of neighboring Arvada, Colorado, may have unraveled and allegedly exploded into mass violence, still unclear. And it would be pre premature for us to draw any conclusions at this point in time. Authorities are searching through social media posts and assessing whether some are authentic, including one posting on a Facebook page where someone identified as Alyssa claims he was mistreated because he was Muslim and complained that he was being hacked. Law enforcement sources telling ABC News they're investigating whether Alyssa suffered from mental health issues. His brother telling the Daily Beast he believes Alyssa was paranoid. Pierre Thomas joins me now. Pierre, we've seen so many of these mass shootings in the last several years. This attack is the latest in a surge of mass shootings and overall violence that we've seen. Incredible. In fact, as we've been focused on the pandemic, in the last three years, we've seen mass shootings nearly double. There were 2,000, excuse me, in 2018, there were 337 such mass uh, shootings. By 2020, the number had jumped to 611. It's alarming numbers. Pierre Thomas, thank you so much for that report. President Biden today called on the House and Senate to act to address gun violence. Let's take a listen to some of his remarks. I don't need to wait another minute, let alone an hour, to take common sense steps that will save the lives in the future and to urge my colleagues in the House and Senate to act. Let's bring in ABC's congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, outline for us the measures that President Biden is proposing that Congress tackle right away. Yeah, a few things here. He wants a ban on high capacity magazines and on all assault weapons. And he also wants senators to pass those two bills that address background checks that were passed in the House not too long ago here. Biden making this clear that it's a priority for him. This is something that they wanted to get done during the Obama administration. Now he is pushing Congress and lawmakers to act, Eva. And Rachel, the Senate Judiciary Committee held a hearing on gun violence today. So where does this all stand? Is it even possible any of these measures could make it through the Senate with enough bipartisan votes to pass. It really does face an uphill challenge in the Senate. Democrats are going to need the support of at least 10 Republicans in order to get it passed. Bottom line, they just do not have the votes. They would have to change the rules in order for this to happen. So tonight, we know the White House is eyeing ways to address gun violence through executive action, but any major reform is going to require Congress and lawmakers just aren't on the same page, Eva. A difficult path there going forward. Rachel Scott for us. Thank you. And for more on the Colorado shooting and the surge of gun violence across the country, we bring in Colorado General Assembly member Thomas Sullivan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And Representative Sullivan, we want to remind people you you actually lost your own son, Alex, in the Aurora Theater shooting in 2012. I mean, I can't even imagine what that loss was like as a father. We are so sorry for you. But seeing yet another mass shooting in your state, what's your reaction to this tragedy and the timing just to 10 days after Boulder's assault weapons ban was blocked in court. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're, we're trying, we're doing, doing the work here, you know, on, on the state level, um, but we're just not getting as, as much help uh, nationally, um, you know, in, in some enactment of that. I mean, we passed an extreme risk protection order here uh, in the state uh, two years ago. Um, We've done. We've already passed background checks, high capacity magazines, uh, doing uh, uh, stuff uh, for making it difficult uh, for uh, concealed carry permits. Um, yet this, you know, um, continues um, to happen, um, and you know it can happen anywhere. You know, in a college town, at a grocery store, uh, people just, uh, you know, live in, uh, you know, the American uh, way of life. And I know you've been lobbying for firearms, background checks, and magazine limits in Colorado. Describe for us the pushback to gun control measures in your state. And do you think, at least in Colorado, this tragedy will move the needle on gun laws? Or could it instead reinforce the idea that we need more good guys with guns? 
Uh, no, I mean, as I say, I mean, 2013, so after the Aurora Theater Massacre in, in July of 2012, and after the, the Sandy Hook Massacre in December of 2012, here in the state of Colorado, we've passed five common sense bills. We've already passed um, a background check. Everybody has to get a background check here in the state of Colorado. We have limited um, high capacity um, magazines to 15 rounds. Uh, we make people pay for their background check. We make people actually have to come in and uh, get a concealed carry um, permit. Um, but um, we also, because of um, the um, fear that is being um, peddled by the Republican Party across um, this country, um, this past year, we had a record-setting number of firearm transfers here in the state of Colorado, over 500,000 of them. Um, were, were bought and sold. Um, so uh, it's just the easy access to firearms. And once you turn 21, the lethal weapons that you're able to buy, you're able to buy assault, um, you know, rifles. And you're, you know, if, if you went out of the state, you could get a high capacity magazine, but, you know, they can switch those magazines out uh, very quickly. Um, so it's it's just the, the the access to it, and that's what we've got to um, you know start to do something about. On the national level, the House this month passed two gun control bills, including the Bipartisan Backgrounds Check Act of 2021, that will come before a very bitterly divided U.S. Senate. What's your prediction about the fate of these bills, and and where do you see there being any amount of common ground between gun rights and gun control advocates? Well, I mean, it's, it's got to go through the Senate, and unless we, um, you know, um, defeat the filibuster, I, I don't think we, we get 60 votes. I mean, if we couldn't if we couldn't pass a background check um, after 26-year-old uh, children uh, were murdered along with six of their, um, you know, uh, teachers and principals, and their parents came down and stood in front of them and gave them that story about what, what that was like, and this was at Christmas time. Time. They couldn't do anything about that. It's difficult uh, for us to think that um, they'll do something um, like that this time. But things are changing. Um, we, uh, as Democrats, have control uh, of the Senate. Um, there can be some uh, some rules changed. I um, am hopeful um, with President Biden um, that he, maybe he can take some executive actions um, for the time being uh, and move us ahead. As a parent who knows too well what a lot of these families are experiencing today, what what is your message to those lawmakers in Washington? Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, you've got to. I mean, this is the the, the American public is asking you to take some action. I mean, you know, ninety percent of Ameri of the, the the public is asking for um, background checks. You know, you have to begin listening to them. Um, we have the votes. We don't all have the money, and that's where they, they, they think the power lies, but the, the power lies in the electorate. And when these types of things continue to happen, we're going to keep standing up. I mean, you know, yesterday's event is going to activate more people. That's going to be their, their point when they said enough is enough. And they're going to be activated. They're going to be contacting their congressmen and their senators. They're going to be start doing what they need um, to get people who see things um, the way that we do, the way that the rest of, of the country does, and pass things like um, banning high-capacity magazines and doing background checks. Representative Sullivan calling for change and action tonight. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Well, tired and afraid. That is how some children who arrived to our nation's border last night described how they were feeling. Over 15,000 unaccompanied migrant children are currently in the custody of U.S. government officials. And today, President Biden facing additional pressure from his own party about his handling of it all. ABC's News Chief White House Correspondent Cecilia Vega brings us the latest from the border. Tonight on the southern border, authorities in a race to keep up. On patrol with deputies from Hidalgo County, Texas, we spot a group of families who just crossed the Rio Grande. Cuatro. Cuatro. ¿De dónde vienes? 
In this group, 15-year-old Jeffrey traveling alone from Honduras. Si, cansadísimo. He's very, very tired, he says. And what's next now that he's arrived? He tells me only God knows. Just up the road, an even bigger group. In it, 9-year-old Justin and 10-year-old Joseph, both traveling alone, walking for more than a month. The group has taken them in, strangers promising to keep them safe. The boys show me phone numbers of family members in the U.S. they soon hope to find. Justin takes off his backpack to show me this hat. This is the number of your father, right? This is his grandfather's phone number. Joseph's aunt's number written right here. Yeah. This is his aunt's phone number. The children, likely to end up in a facility like this. They still won't allow journalists inside, but Customs and Border Patrol releasing this video shot last week. Only 250 people are supposed to be held here. Instead, they're close to 4,000. Side by side, huddled under foil blankets, toddlers in a playpen, being watched by a caretaker. Tonight, the White House under fire from all sides, accused of not having a plan in place to handle the surge after it overturned many of President Trump's hardline immigration policies. Democratic Congressman Henry Cuellar of Texas calling the situation at the border something the White House won't, a humanitarian crisis. The administration has all the good intentions. They want to treat the kids in a humane way. But in trying to do this, their good intentions are being overwhelmed by numbers. The children just keep coming. Those little boys we met, Justin and Joseph. Justin tucking that hat with his grandfather's phone number away for safekeeping. Are you scared, I asked? Yes, they tell me they're scared. Cecilia Vega joins us now. The stories from those children underscore what authorities say is happening. Families in these countries realize that if kids come alone, they will be allowed to stay. Yeah, Eva, you know, it's a catch-22. We actually called Justin's grandfather. His na his number was the one that was on that pink hat there that you saw in the piece. And he told us that Justin's mom sent her young son north alone because she understood that authorities were allowing young migrants who crossed alone if they come into contact with the Border Patrol to stay. And that's true. That's happening. And the White House says it's happening because the Trump administration sent those children back alone. They call that policy inhumane. Eva, the one thing, the universal thing we found in talking to all of these people on the border out here is they are fleeing desperate situations back home. Just heartbreaking story. Cecilia Vega for us there at the border. Thank you. We turn now to COVID-19 and a troubling vaccine report from AstraZeneca coming shortly after they released promising data from their U.S. trial. NIH officials saying the company may have included outdated information that clouded the picture of its effectiveness. What's next for this potential fourth COVID vaccine? ABC's Stephanie Ramos has this report. Just hours after AstraZeneca released promising results of its U.S. vaccine trial, the National Institutes of Health questioning the findings, saying the company may have included outdated information from that trial, which may have provided an incomplete view of the efficacy data. AstraZeneca reporting its vaccine was 79% effective at preventing symptomatic disease and 100% effective at preventing severe disease and hospitalization. The company acknowledging those numbers were based on data through mid-February and is now promising to turn over newer data within 48 hours. This is really what you call an unforced error because the fact is this is very likely a very good vaccine and this kind of thing does do nothing but really cast some doubt uh, about the vaccines and maybe contribute to the hesitancy. Dr. Anthony Fauci insisting the FDA will independently review all the data. 16 states are seeing cases increase by at least 10% in the last week, and alarming scenes like these only fueling concern as more contagious variants spread through every state. I am worried that if we don't take the right actions now, we will have another avoidable surge just as we are seeing in Europe right now. Stephanie Ramos, ABC News, New York. When we come back, the National Guard soldiers transporting COVID vaccines when they are suddenly held up at gunpoint. What happened next? We've talked so much about those much needed stimulus checks, but what do you do if you are homeless and have no bank account? And up next, how the mRNA technology behind the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines is now being looked at to tackle cancer. Stay with us.
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. From COVID to cancer, revolutionary vaccine technology called mRNA has produced two COVID vaccines so far. And tonight, doctors, scientists, and companies like Pfizer and Moderna are excited about what might be possible in the future. That revolutionary COVID vaccine technology from Pfizer and Moderna, the first options on the market, now going into arms across the country. It was a game-changing development that has given America a path to end the pandemic. If you look back at the dates, I think we went from the sequencing of the virus to releasing our first GMP badge in less than two months. In fact, within 60 odd days, it had started its first clinical trial. Moderna was founded on the idea of mRNA vaccines, a reality now saving lives. I joined this company 10 years ago because I fell in love with this idea and I didn't think we'd have the moment we're just having. Moderna President Stephen Hogue believes this is only the beginning. We do think that there's going to be waves upon waves of medicines that are brought forward by our company and others using this technology. And I'm excited to see what that application space looks like in the years ahead. Doctors and scientists are hopeful that messenger RNA or mRNA could one day help eradicate AIDS, change how we treat the flu, and cure cancer. In essence, mRNA helps steer our immune system, directing it around the bumps in the road while it patches up the potholes. It really is an instruction set for what a cell should make and what a cell should do. And so you can use that information to tell the body to make something, to steer the immune system towards a certain target. For COVID, mRNA is able to replicate a critical part of the virus, launching an immune response, telling our bodies how to target and attack the virus. And that is a really effective strategy as a vaccine for COVID. And so the thought has been, can we use similar approaches to steer the immune system to actually attack cancer? And I think that's a really promising avenue. Doctors at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute at Harvard are already hard at work. So are you feeling pretty good that this could be groundbreaking for cancer treatments or are you yeah. still have a ways to go? We're really excited, but also cautious. With cancer, the current treatments, while often effective, can be painful and difficult. When you talk about the current ways that we treat cancer, I mean, it's pretty brutal for the patient. 
Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I think, especially when people think of these sort of conventional type of chemotherapy, the stuff that make people really nauseous and sick, it's essentially a poison for the cells that you really hope affects the cancer cells more than affects the person. And the companies that delivered the first COVID mRNA vaccines aren't stopping there. A new race fast developing and the winners here will be all of us. We have about 24 programs in development. 12 of them are therapeutics and another the other dozen are vaccines. The company's 24 programs include efforts to treat cancer, the flu and HIV. I mean, we've been trying to cure cancer for forever. We've been trying to cure HIV AIDS for forever. Do you think this is going to be the answer to some of those things? We really hope so, and, and I think we do. Uh, we are testing an HIV vaccine clinic this year in collaboration with the NIH again because we think that there have been advances in the basic science and in the technology side that allow us to do this. Cancer is a more uh, difficult foe, as, as we all know, but we, are, we have several medicines in clinic looking to try and treat cancer. Today, Pfizer announcing it is developing more mRNA vaccines. The company confirming to ABC News it will work on a vaccine to target the flu. The European company Pfizer worked with, BioNTech, also confirming it plans to use this technology to try and tackle cancer. The international effort already producing promising findings. Dana-Farber Cancer Institute this month announcing encouraging first signs of a possible vaccine for kidney cancer. It shows that one, these vaccines really can trigger the immune system to recognize the cancer, to recognize the tumor. And that second, it looks like that immune system reaction might actually be long lived. As vice president, now President Biden led a moonshot to cure cancer. Thanks to mRNA, that and so much more may now be closer to reality than ever before. I'm really excited to think about what the next 10 years of science brings with this technology. We now have tools in our hands as scientists, as, as clinicians, that, um, that sounded like science fiction a few years ago. Some hope on the horizon. Well, still ahead here on Prime, jury selection is now complete in the George Floyd murder trial. But what is the makeup of those jurors? History is made in one Illinois town. The first to approve reparations will speak to an alderman behind that decision. And for those who think gun violence went away during most of the pandemic, we take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, a reminder that mass shooting death tolls aren't just statistics. They are loved ones who will forever be missed, like Kevin Mahoney, who walked his anguished daughter down the aisle just last summer and is suddenly gone. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming.
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America. America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. As the nation reels from two horrifying mass shootings in less than a week, we are reminded that gun violence hasn't abated during the pandemic. In fact, it has spiked. Here's a look by the numbers. 4,128 Americans' lives have been lost to gun violence so far in 2021, and that doesn't include suicides, according to the Gun Violence Archive. 19,380, that was the number in 2020 when the pandemic took hold, which was a significant increase from 15,440 gun violence deaths in 2019. And despite lockdowns and other COVID restrictions, there were 611 mass shootings in 2020, according to the Gun Violence Archive, which defines these as shootings with four or more victims injured or killed, excluding the shooter. That was a spike from the 417 mass shootings in 2019 and 337 in 2018. 2020 also saw a surge in U.S. gun registrations, 39.7 million Instant firearm checks were conducted last year, according to the NICS data, which provides some indication of gun purchases. That was a 40% surge from 2019 and the highest number in at least two decades. We still have so much more to get to here on Prime tonight. The deadly nursing home fire in assisted living facility and the investigation now underway. Is the fourth time the charm? Israel is for the fourth time trying to figure out who its next prime minister will be. Can you imagine going through four elections here in the U.S. to decide our next president? But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. We will guide you through it all tonight. made it through another week together. Give me a big hug, Richard. We tell all our patients how much they're loved. We hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020. Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC.
the most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Today, the magnitude of the loss here in Boulder setting in. 10 people shot and killed at this grocery store. Suzanne Fountain, 59. Terry Liker, 51. Among those killed, Ricky Olds, a 25-year-old manager at the King Supers. Her family describes as strong, independent, and bubbly. And 51-year-old Boulder police officer Eric Talley, a father of seven. He lost his life in the line of duty. He was heroically trying to save others. Police now say that shooter was 21-year-old Ahmad Alaliwi Alisa. He has been charged with 10 counts of murder in the first degree. President Joe Biden ordering flags lowered to half staff for the second time in just a week and urging the Senate to pass gun control legislation. Another American city has been scarred by gun violence and resulting trauma. We can save lives. Increasing the background checks so that they're supposed to occur. Eliminating assault weapons and the size of magazines. In Minneapolis, jury selection is now over in the trial of Derek Chauvin, the former police officer charged with George Floyd's murder. A 15th juror was seated on Tuesday, bringing to a close jury selection for the trial of Derek Chauvin. That 15th juror will be released on Monday, Judge Peter Cahill said, if all the other jurors show up. I'm hopeful that uh, since it's only a few days, that we'll have 14 people show up and those 14 will be seated and sworn. In Idaloo, Texas, a delivery of COVID vaccines by the National Guard almost turned deadly. 66-year-old Larry Harris is facing charges after allegedly holding 11 unarmed guard soldiers at gunpoint. Williams says Harris thought the soldiers had kidnapped a woman and child when he spotted them at this gas station and followed them for 10 miles, telling the National Guard he needed to search their caravan. He made a U-turn in the highway and parked his vehicle head on in front of those vans, got out, uh, announced that he was a detective, didn't show a badge, didn't show credentials. The soldiers were actually delivering COVID-19 vaccines to Matador. While Harris searched the vans, one guardsman called 911, and Idaloo police arrived in minutes. A deadly fire at an assisted living facility in Spring Valley. The flames broke out overnight while many of the residents were sleeping. One person was killed, another dozen injured. Right now, firefighters are still looking for one of their own who remains missing. Nearly every part of the three-story Evergreen adult home crumbled in a fire that began just before one this morning. A call for mutual aid went out immediately, and that call kept going as one of their guys, desperate to reach victims on the third level, became trapped. And if conditions worsened, they had to pull themselves out of the building for their own uh, safety sake. One resident died at the hospital, and the search continues for the missing fireman. It's gut-wrenching. In Israel, the polls are closed in the fourth election in two years to decide Israel's next leader. COVID-19 changing the way this election looks here in Israel. That despite 80% of adults being vaccinated. For the first time, polling stations going up at Ben Gurion International Airport, where Israelis returning home are voting before entering quarantine. For COVID-19 patients, special booths at hospitals, the seriously ill are having boxes brought to their bedside. The election committee warning it will take longer this time to count the votes. Absentee ballots also expected to double. As stimulus checks begin going out to millions of Americans, there's one group most in need who may struggle to get it the homeless. So advocates around the country are working to make sure those living on the streets or in their cars have access to this much needed relief. Here's ABC's Mary Alice Parks. Trisha Lee says she has not had any luck so far collecting one of those stimulus checks offered from the federal government during the pandemic, although she and her son are facing incredibly hard times. For the past year, she's lived on and off the streets in downtown Chicago after she lost her job and her apartment. She says she tried to sign up online for the payment, but with libraries closed, figuring out the right forms felt impossible. It's very hard when your cell phone, you don't have your minutes on it or whatever, you don't have Wi-Fi, you can't call them, you can't contact them. Still, after all the effort, another roadblock. I found out I was approved. They, they emailed me back and said, you were approved. And then um, because I didn't have an address, they couldn't mail anything to me. No address, no money. Yeah, the people just give up. Just makes it too difficult. 
too depressing, actually. Trisha is not alone. Local officials say housing insecurity has risen sharply across the country in this last year, with more people living in their cars and on the street. While national stats for 2020 aren't available yet, according to a new report from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, over 580,000 people experienced homelessness even before the pandemic began. Without basic resources, many of the most vulnerable Americans have struggled to get direct payments they were eligible for. But across the country, advocates have stepped in. Ryan Spangler with Heartland Alliance in Chicago is helping people like Trish. So far, he's worked with hundreds of local residents to navigate the red tape and hurdles to get their payments. We were able to you know, go out there with laptops and hotspots and help folks sign up for the stimulus. You know, the question that we asked ourselves was, um, you know, how can we ensure that people that have a right to this money um, but, you know, have barriers um, actually get it. The third round of stimulus checks were approved, as you know, and it uh, looks like we should probably receive the check, I'm guessing, in the next two to three weeks. I mean, he went, like, over and beyond. With Ryan's help, Chanel was able to receive her direct payments. With the aid she received in December, she says she bought food and propane. Without it, she's not sure how she would have gotten through the winter. I don't know. <laughs> A lot of blankets, I guess. Experts say an estimated 10 million of the poorest Americans had not recently needed to file tax returns. Because of that, they were not automatically in the IRS's system to receive direct stimulus payments this last year. Even after people were signed up, if they did not have bank accounts, they were either sent debit cards or paper checks. And cashing those paper checks could be a challenge. Do you feel like that's been an issue with the majority of people you've worked with? don't have bank accounts right now? Yes, the vast majority. Most folks are getting the paper checks and then being like, okay, what do I do with this now? Because I don't know how to, you know, I, I, I can't really cash it because I don't have an ID and then, you know, the DMV is closed and I can't get a so social. In Birmingham, Alabama, Erica Robbins worked with individual bankers she knew to make sure some of her neighbors could get checks cashed. And just because people don't have four walls and a roof does not mean, you know, that they're not... Um, your neighbors, just because they are on the street, doesn't mean that they're not, you know, citizens. Because of their situation and their lack of resources, especially with libraries closed and things like that, how are they going to apply for this money? I said, hey, we need some laptops, <laughs> some tablets, and some volunteers, and we're going to help people get this money. Word spread fast. Erica took appointments at a nearby church that also let them use their mailing address to receive checks. It was it, such a blessing. When the checks started rolling in and they started um, receiving that money, they would, you know, run up to me and say, Miss Erica, thank you so much. You know, I got my check. I was able to get a hotel room for a few days. I, and, you know, I was able to take a shower. Millions of Americans are currently eligible for their third direct payment since the pandemic began. The IRS says they are making improvements to their systems and working directly with partners and shelters. But both Erica and Ryan say signing people up has not gotten easier. Have you felt support from the state government, the federal government in doing this work? I don't think they're doing enough. Even if you're dealing with shelters, we deal with street homes. There are so many people that are not in the shelter system. An added challenge, if someone did not sign up last year, the IRS is now asking individuals to file a full tax return. If you signed up for the first check, uh, you can get all the other checks sent to the same place. So as long as your address hasn't changed, you're, you're fine. Um, it's, so it's harder to sign up folks now that haven't signed up at all. Um, and because you have to file taxes and for someone living on the street that's homeless, that's a difficult process. In Burlington, North Carolina, Janet Triola runs Fresh Start Alamance and helped Donald McBride secure his stimulus check, which he says he used to buy food and pay for a temporary place to stay. I don't know how to work on that computer, no way. Mm -hmm. I mean, be honest, I wouldn't know how to do that stuff. She helped all of us out on anything she can. And that's a blessing. But Janet says jobs and affordable housing are still too hard to come by. So a, a stimulus check is great, but 
it's it's a band-aid and it's really hard to get a job if you don't have certain skills or because there are so many people looking for jobs you can't get housing and you can't keep housing um, if you don't have a job. The latest COVID relief package includes $5 billion for emergency homeless services, another $25 billion in rental assistance, as well as funding for substance abuse treatment, health care, and child care. A $1,400 check um, is, is obviously not enough um, to, to solve someone's homelessness, but it is an incredibly important incentive for people to address some issues that may be barriers. It'll give people uh, money for down payments, money to pay utility arrearages, uh, money to be able to afford rent for a couple of months. So uh, it is an enormous um, uh, positive outcome for people living in uh, on the margins and especially those who have gone into homelessness. For ABC News, I'm Mary Alice Parks. Our thanks to Mary Alice for that report. Now to the latest developments in the efforts to provide reparations to black Americans. The city of Evanston, Illinois last night approved the first spending from the city's landmark reparations program designed to compensate black residents for discrimination. I'm joined now by Alderman Robin Sue Simmons, who first proposed the reparations initiative. And, and let's just talk about this. Last night's measure focuses an initial $400,000 in funds to address discriminatory housing policies and practices faced by black residents in Evanston with qualified black households receiving up to $25,000 towards home repairs, down payments or mortgage payments. Explain to us how this would work and why the council has chosen to focus on housing as the way to distribute the funds. Um, thank you for the question. So the council was informed by the community. We have a very engaged um, community here, abroad, uh, our at-large community as well as our stakeholder community. And through a series of um, public meetings in 2019, we heard from our stakeholder community on what reparations should look like in application in Evanston. And housing was largely a uh, response. In addition, housing is in our purview um, as a municipal government and additionally, um, our case for reparations in Evanston is largely found in housing and anti-Black uh, practices and policies that were enforced here in Evanston that stripped away uh, wealth from the Black community. So we moved forward with housing as our first remedy uh, priority because it met the concerns of the community, but it also meets the concerns of the program in building wealth as well as um, providing a sense of place and sustaining and growing back our black community that has declined to now around 16% when we were uh, much higher in the 20 percentile range before. So this first installment of $400,000 will be spent in $25,000 allotments. When you do the math on that, that means a max of 16 black families can participate. I know you say this is just a first step, but what do you say to the critics who say that's too small to have an impact and that this is a housing program dressed up as reparations? It's absolutely reparations because it is a fund set aside specifically for the black community in response to anti-black practices and harms um, historically that we've had um, for the purpose of repair. So it's absolutely reparations. I agree with any critic that says that it's not enough. Um, if you're looking at this initial initiative, um, this single program as uh, full repair, it's absolutely not enough. It's a first necessary step. Our funding is coming from cannabis sales tax revenue, so we do not have access to $10 million today. We're getting the funding incrementally as cannabis is sold in our city and the state returns the tax revenue to us. So our program will be rolled out um, on an incremental but urgent basis. Um, my hope is that the critics and those on the subcommittee and the city council and partners work more to increase the fund, expand the programming, um, and not dismantle um, our initial first steps. This is an opportunity for us to uh, create momentum, prove a concept that we can have uh, reparations, we can have reparative justice specifically for the black community um, to uh, restore harms, and in this case, 
it is building well. Now, when we kind of zoom out and look at this from a national scale, some Democrats in Washington have also been calling for reparations for that conversation to happen on the national level. Do you think that will ever make progress or are the politics just just too difficult? I do. I believe that it'll make progress. We see what's happening in Evanston and many other cities um, in the United States, including most recently Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, we know that we have over 170 co-sponsors for HR 40 now. We have a Senate companion bill. We have a president who has stated he supports the, um, the study of reparations. We have vice president who was a co-sponsor of S-10 when it was a Senate companion bill. And then we have the community will and heart. Um, the time is now. The civil unrest and the um, pain and trauma we experienced from the public lynching of George Floyd, the conditions and disparate conditions in the black community from COVID, how it's impacted our health and financially crippled us even further. Um, I believe that we will see HR 40 pass under the incredible leadership of Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee in the near future. Alderman Simmons, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. And we'll be back in a moment with our image of the day. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burn it. When you were a kid, what kind of things did you watch? What kind of characters were you drawn to? I'm a dance sister. <laughs> Why? You don't have any rhythm. I was watching a lot of American TV. Sister Act was one of my favorites, Whoopi Goldberg. She was like the, the pinnacle because she was able to do it all. She was able to do it all on tonight's special broadcast of the ABC series Soul of a Nation. Actor Cynthia Erivo sits down with Janae Norman to discuss her journey as an actress and her role as Aretha Franklin in the Nat Geo series Genius Aretha. You can catch Soul of a Nation tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Take a look at this painting of a boy playing with a toy nurse who is a superhero. It was made by the elusive street artist Bang 
Banksy. It's called Game Changer, and it's sold for more than $20 million at auction. The painting is a tribute to all frontline workers, and proceeds from the sale will be used to fund well-being projects for health care providers in the UK. Well, that's it for our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Eva Pilgrim. Thanks for streaming with us.